You're listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, I'm Annie from snowy Massachusetts in the USA. And I'm Johanna from sunny Austria, and you're listening to your favorite international podcast. That wasn't an April Fool's joke. We in the Northeast, it is April 4th, and we are in the middle of an April nor'easter with terrible wind and rain, and we had some snow this morning. So I've just got everything crossed that we don't lose power, and you cannot hear the sleet on my windows. It should be fine. My trusty phone box has let us through many a squall in the past, so... <laughs> Um, before we start, I just want to give a shout out to Doug. Hi, Doug, one of our longtime listeners who often contacts us with really interesting and great thoughts that he has on our episodes. Doug reached out asking about last week's episode, which covered the murder of Kelly Jean Poppleton. In that episode, I also discussed the deaths of Tina Fales, Julie Ann Connolly, and Lisa Ann Monzo, as well as Francis Rash, and whether or not a serial killer may have been involved. Uh, Doug asked quite thoughtfully if the serial killer duo, Leonard Lake and Charles Eng, had been ruled out from those crimes. And I completely forgot to mention that, yes, they had been tested and they had been ruled out. Yeah, Lake and Eng were serial killers responsible for the murder of 11 confirmed victims, but more than twice that suspected to be victims. And many of the victims were in absolute similar location and time frame to Kelly's murder. So that was really a good thought. Mm -hmm, definitely. And their DNA is in the system. They were ruled out. They were not responsible for Kelly or Francis. But on that DNA front, I think every day uh, more and more of the Lake and Eng victims are identified uh, with DNA. I had intended to mention that last week and forgot. So thanks again, Doug, for reaching out. And if you want to know more about that terrible series of murders by Lake and Eng, there are, I mean, take your pick, plenty of podcasts, books, and other sources to dig into. It, be warned, though, it's a terrible, terrifying case. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, now it's time to get into today's case. It's an old timey murder that took place in Germany. Well, it's not an old timey murder. It's old timey murders. Plural. <laughs> because today I will tell you all you need to know about the German serial killer Karl Hopf. My biggest source for this episode is the book Frankfurter Giftmorde, Der Fall Karl Hopf by Thomas Schnepf, as well as some newspaper articles, some modern as well as contemporary. As always, we'll list all the sources in the according album. And this was a huge case at the time that also brought significant advances in forensic medicine. And there is a lot to talk about, some rather bizarre stuff as well. Therefore, this will be a two-part episode. All right. Are you ready, Annie? I'm so excited. I'm very ready. Karl Ludwig Heinrich Emanuel Hopf. That's four first names. Yeah. Well, one first name and three middle names. So Hopf was born on 26th of March 1863 in Frankfurt am Main to parents Karl Paulus Wilhelm Hopf and his wife Auguste Emilie, whose maiden name was Lutz. The Hopf family was a typical German middle-class family of the time, religious, hardworking. We talked many, many, many times about the Industrial Revolution and how it changed and shaped society and life in the cities. But I think so far we mostly either talked about it from the working class point of view or from nobility's point of view. Right? I don't think we ever really talked about middle class Industrial Revolution. Yeah, I pre, think you're right. Uh, World War One. Mm. Yeah. So the middle class, they were quite the movers and shakers of their time in those bustling cities that we mentioned so often with the booming industries. They were actually the ones building the factories and running the shops. 
And of course, here in Europe, we had a very stiff class system. It's not like uh, the child of a working class family could easily attend school, attend university and work their way up to middle class. It happened, but it was very rare and very hard. I think that's why so many people left and went to North America to try to, you know, overcome this class system. Mm -hmm. Education, of course, was crucial and middle class families were able to give their kids a leg up in the world. So Hans, Peter, Liesel and Gretel, well, let's be realistic here, it's more Hans and Peter and less Liesel and Gretel. So they weren't just learning their ABCs, they were mastering math science, and maybe a little bit of Latin if they were feeling fancy. Uh, no, they actually had to learn Latin. After all, knowledge was power, and these families wanted their children to have the tools to make something of themselves. But it wasn't all about books and blackboards. Practical skills were just as important. Papa might have been the businessman by day, but come evening he was teaching young Fritz the ins and outs of running a shop. And meanwhile, Mama was busy imparting her wisdom on the art of homemaking to little Liesel. Because even in the age of industry, a well-run household was the cornerstone of middle-class life. Home life was of course traditional back then, so Dad brought home the sausages, while Mom handled everything else, cooking, cleaning and keeping the family in line. So there you have it, the German middle class of the mid-19th century. They may not have had castles or crowns, but they definitely had ambition, determination and a whole lot of grit. And you know who else had a lot of determination and ambition? Karl Hopf Jr. But determination and ambition is not always a good thing, right? Of course, his parents wanted him to receive proper education and so he was sent to a gymnasium. A gymnasium is not a gymnasium, not a gym. In a gymnasium, you train more your brain and less your muscles. And it's pretty much a school that has almost no other job than prepare you for university. I should know what I'm talking about because I went to a gymnasium for eight years, where I graduated at age 18. And you can send me to any pub quiz or TV show. But don't expect mm -hmm. me to know any life skills. <laughs> yeah, you're our resident quiz show expert for sure. <laughs> uh, I think gymnasium is pretty much comparable to high school in a way, but with almost no focus on things like, I don't know, debate club or sports, but a lot of Latin, natural science, history, literature. And back when Karl Hopf attended, he was probably also learning ancient Greek. Well, I really have to applaud the Austrian Austrian gymnasium system because you are a font, an actual font of information. You're so knowledgeable. You know everything. It's amazing. But the thing is, they also teach you to talk and act as if you know everything. But really Yes, I don't. do understand that side of things. <laughs> So apparently Karl Hopf Jr., he wasn't dead into gymnasium life because he left school after the Untersekunde, which is after sixth grade here. And I think that would be the 10th grade in US high schools. Is that correct? So if he left at age 16, that was, would it be 10? Yeah, I think, I think 10th or 11th grade. Because I think you count it very similar actually to Germany. Here in Austria, we count the elementary school as uh, one to grades one through four. And then yeah. you switch school and you start at one again. So I went one through four elementary school and then one through eight in gymnasium. Yeah, I think you're close. I think I think it depends what time of the year you were born um, as to what year you'd go into that like entering mm -hmm. school. Do you know what I mean? But 16, yeah, you'd be either a sophomore or a junior. I was a junior when I was 16. It doesn't matter, though. Yeah, you're, you're right. Yeah, he left around 16. Just for our international listeners to have an idea what, what sixth grade would be. Yeah. So he wasn't done studying, even though he didn't attend university. But he did travel to London to become a pharmacist via an apprenticeship. Uh, he was quite the adventurous young man after London. He lived for a while in Casablanca, so in Morocco. And he also traveled to India, but apparently he fell ill, he contracted malaria, and the disease forced him to return to Europe to recover. During his travels, though, he had discovered his love and very huge talent for fencing, 
He received extensive training in foil and saber fencing, which he mastered with great skill. He apparently even won a world championship title in the art of saber fencing while in London. Now, do people still fall into fencing as a hobby while on an extended world tour? Is this a thing? Is this a thing that still happens? Has it happened to anyone recently? And if so, could you please email us so we can be friends and I can live vicariously through you? Because just the idea. I have the feeling this kind of thing still happen, but just to very, very wealthy people. Very wealthy people. Yeah. In 1894, so when Karl Hopf was 31 years old, he had returned to Germany to his birthplace, Frankfurt, to be exact. And he had no money. All he possessed were the clothes he wore and a bunch of nice sabers and foils. But still, he managed to purchase a house in Wörsdorf, which is 50 kilometers or 31 miles northwest of Frankfurt am Main. He also started his own business, a store selling pet food. Now, you might wonder how he was even able to buy a house and open his own shop if he had zero money. Well, thanks to daddy, his father gave him the money he needed for both of these purchases. I don't think we can imagine his business like the ones we are used to now, where you get all different kind of pet food and treats and dog cupcakes and cat lollipops and guinea pig birthday cakes and all this stuff. You all know exactly what I'm talking about. You are oh, yeah. people. <laughs> oh yeah. Shop just like that in Provincetown is where I got you that beagle sign. Oh, it's proudly displayed in my kitchen, by the way. I love that picture you sent me. No, but this was the late 19th century in no. Germany. This was a no-nonsense animal food business that sold concentrated feed to your cows and chickens. But Karl was actually very interested in dogs as well. And he not only had this animal food business, but also started his own kennel, a dog breeding business specializing in breeding St. Bernard's, or as we call them in German, Bernhardina. So St. Bernard's are those gentle giants with hearts as big as their paws, and they have quite a fascinating history. And you know, whenever I say that, that's uh, the moment for fun fact and side tangent. Here mm -hmm. we go. So they originated in the Swiss Alps. These absolutely majestic dogs were initially bred by monks at the hospice of St. Bernard Pass that was established in the 11th century. The St. Bernard's Pass is a treacherous mountain route connecting Switzerland and Italy. The precise origins of the St. Bernard breed are somewhat shrouded in mystery, but they are believed to be the descendants of ancient mastiff-type dogs brought to the region by actually the Romans. Mm -hmm. uh, battle, uh, battle dogs, I think. They used yeah. mastiff as battle dogs, yeah. Yep. Uh, however, it was the monks of the St. Bernard Hospice who selectively bred these dogs for their absolutely remarkable abilities in search and rescue operations amidst the harsh alpine conditions. The most famous role of St. Bernard's was undoubtedly their work as rescue dogs in the snowy mountains. With their keen sense of smell, incredible strength and their thick fur coats, they were perfect for that job and invaluable companions for travelers stranded or lost in the unforgiving Alps. These noble creatures would traverse the treacherous paths, often braving avalanches, avalanches and extreme <laughs> weather to locate and aid those in need and distress. Let's talk about Barry. Barry, the legendary Saint Bernard, is perhaps one of the most famous examples of the breed's heroic nature. He was born in Switzerland in 1800 and Barry was a rescue dog stationed at the Great St. Bernard Hospice. During his lifetime, Barry reportedly saved the lives of over 40 people who were lost or stranded in the mountains. Barry's bravery and selflessness made him a beloved figure both locally and internationally. His legacy lives on through various memorials and commemorations, including a monument erected in his honor at the Cimetière de Gien Pet Cemetery in Paris, France. Uh, remember last week we talked about Bosco, the honorary mayor of Sunnel, and Annie thought for a hot minute that they had taxidermied <laughs> Bosco and have him pee beer at a bar now. I really did. <laughs> well, Barry has actually been taxidermied and oh, no. can be seen at the Naturhistorische Museum in Bern. I think they, they kind of 
restored him. He looks good. Oh, he does. He really looks good. I have to send you a photo. Okay. I'll post one tomorrow. There is a story that Barry was killed by the 41st person he tried to rescue. I hope by accident. I don't know. That's horrible. It's not true. He actually lived the last two years of his life in Bern, enjoying his retirement. Good. Again, sorry for this side tangent, but we can't not talk about dogs if there's, to- if there's dogs to talk about. And Barry was one of the reasons why St. Bernard's became super popular in the second half of the 19th century. I don't even for a moment apologize for talking about dogs. Dog facts are my favorite. <laughs> I know I'm not alone in this. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, people just really started to love those gentle giants who are known for their kind and affectionate nature. Especially, apparently, they're really good with children. They have a very calm demeanor and friendly disposition, which makes them beloved family pets and also therapy dogs to Mm. this day. Mm -hmm. In popular culture, though, St. Bernard's have been immortalized in numerous books, films and advertisements, often depicted as saviors and companions in times of need. I think we all know the most iconic images associated with St. Bernard's. Um, That's the image of the dog with a small keg of brandy around its neck or rum. Yes, or a hot chocolate. Yeah, or hot chocolate. Although historically this practice is apparently, I'm sorry, more myth than reality. No, I thought it was reality. There's no, (laughs) there's nothing, there's no like hot chocolate with a little Kahlua in there. There's nothing in a thermos, especially insulated, so that when you're yanked free from the avalanche by moist, slobbery chompers, <laughs> they drag you out into the snow, and then you're all slimy, but like safe, and then they're like, hey, have a nice, warm, boozy beverage. No, that's all a Wouldn't lie. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, that's how I thought it Looks happened, like- and you're just destroying all my dreams. Do they not carry anything? What's the whole thing with the barrel? Do you even... Is it just... I don't know. I it's don't okay. think they carry anything. No. I don't know. It was probably like one stylized yeah, thing I was thinking, that took like off. One of the monks liked to have like his brandy with him. Smart. I should start making Opus carry a thermos. He could. Or maybe they had some like um, bandages or Right. That would make sense. There. A first aid. I, you know what? I bet that's exactly what it was. I bet they carried a first aid kit or something. Possible. Maybe. We'll have to look into that we'll for see. our next dog episode. We'll find out. So yeah, Karl Hopf Jr. thought it would make great sense to start a St. Bernard breeding business. From what I understand, it was not just something he did to profit off. It seems he was really interested in dogs. Mm. He experimented on remedies for dogs, even working with a local vet, coming up with medicine for mange and canine distemper, which are very serious. um, Very serious, yeah. Diseases, yeah. He also wrote a book about the breeding and care of St. Bernard's, and he won some awards with his dogs. This all sounds great, right? But don't be fooled. Not everybody who is interested in dogs is a good person. Okay. So what I'm hearing is, Annie, stop thinking that the world traveling fencer with a pet shop is a catch. Is that what you're telling me? Because a world traveling fencer with a pet shop sounds like a catch. Totally. On paper, absolutely. Right. And I think that was the problem that many women thought he's a cat. Oh, dear. Okay. And also given his character, and I will get into that a little bit more later on, um, and also don't forget the general treatment of dogs at the time. I mean, I'm pretty sure they were not allowed to sleep in his bed and sit on his couch. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, did they? Yeah. They probably didn't have at least a cozy bed by the fire or... Yeah, no. I doubt that his dogs were treated amazingly, but that's just my gut feeling. I don't know more about that. Also... He did use them for his experiments trying to find a remedy and he had his whole lab set up at home where he also kept different kinds of poison like arsenic and he kind of collected bacillin, which I think in in English the plural for bacillus is bacilli. Mm. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I think that's Again, more on that later. Oh dear. I told you there's a lot of of stuff going on in this Yeah, there's a a lot happening in this one. Okay. It gets worse. Okay, (laughs) great. It always does. (laughs) 
So when Karl Hopf bought his house and opened his business in 1894, he was still unmarried, which means he had nobody to clean his house and wash his dirty socks. <gasps> so <laughs> that's what, what wives are for. Obviously. So he hired a housekeeper and he found one in the young and pretty Elise. And she not only became Karl's housekeeper, she also became his mistress, unfortunately. And as it often happens, especially back in the days where, when there was not a lot of um, contraceptives, Elisa got pregnant. And on 16th of April, 1895, their son, also named Karl, was born. And we can't know for sure, but it's not hard to imagine that the fact that this was Karl Hopf's illegitimate son was kind of an open secret in, in this small town, I right. assume, even though probably nobody talked about it. But I mean, yeah, we know how that works, right? And it's also not hard to imagine that Elise hoped that Hopf would marry her. Uh, life for an unmarried woman and a child born out of wedlock was extremely hard at the time. They were pretty much social pariahs. But Hopf wouldn't marry Elise. His parents couldn't even know about the fact that he fathered a child. Even though it's not hard to imagine they kind of suspected it was his. I mean. All of a sudden there's a baby in the house. Yeah. And then, wouldn't you know it, Elisa fell sick. Before she had started working for Karl Hopf, she was this healthy, strong young woman. But now she would constantly suffer from headaches and felt nauseous and weak all the time. And then, tragedy hit. Her son Karl died at the age of one. And we know this is not uncommon for the time. Many young children unfortunately passed away and Carl died on 1st of April 1896 from apparently an inflammation caused by an abscess tooth or so Karl Hopf claimed. Oh. And because the death of young children was nothing out of the ordinary, nobody really thought anything about it. And another person died that year, Karl Hopf's father, Karl Hopf Sr., and even though he was already elderly and not super healthy, his death still came unexpectedly. After his father's death, Carl Jr. sold his animal food business. It wasn't that successful anyway. And he packed up his St. Bernard's kennel and skipped town, leaving the grieving Elisa behind. And all I can say is good for her. Yeah, seriously. He then moved to Eschborn. Back then, a rural area just outside of Frankfurt and today an urban area just on the northwestern outskirts of the city. And there he bought a farm and he continued with his dog breeding. In 1899, so when Karl Hopf Jr. was 36 years old, he met his first wife, 25-year-old Josefa Hennel. And the two got married on 18th of July, 1899. Josefa was the daughter of middle-class parents, but there was not so much wealth that she brought into the marriage. But she was hardworking, keeping their home clean and taking care of her husband, washing his dirty socks, for example. I mean, who else is going to do it? And what more could Karl ask for? Who cared that they owed money to the grocery store and often had to borrow money from Josefa's parents? Not Karl, no. He loved his wife and had no sinister plans at all. Spoiler alert, he totally had sinister plans. I never would have guessed. No, not Carl. He seemed so on the up and up. Now that you told me not to trust him, I totally would have been bamboozled by this guy, to be fair. I would have been Carl Bate. Ugh. Okay, Annie, we covered so many murders from that era. What do you think was his plan? So, if Yosefa wasn't rich, he wasn't after money. So that, I think he is after money. She just doesn't have any. So I'm going to go with something very popular at the time, murdering <laughs> murdering your spouse for life insurance. The old, you can always make money out of the death of your spouse. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, Carl had the great idea to get a life insurance for his wife with himself, obviously, as the beneficiary. So a doctor had to check Yosef and Carl, and they were both absolutely super healthy. So they got a life insurance. In case one of them would die, the other one would receive 20,000 mark. It was a bit hard for me to figure out how much money that would be nowadays. 
So yeah, it was a little bit hard, the inflation calculator, because uh, the German mark was a pretty new thing. So I don't know. It told me that 20,000 mark from 1899 would be 164,000 euros today. Mm. I'm like, okay, fine. You can get a fine horse and a decent carpet for that, right? Then I checked further. In 1900, the average monthly income was 62 and a half mark. So that would make 20,000 mark 320 times the monthly average income. Today, the average income in Germany after taxes seems to be 2,800 euros. So that times 320 would be 896,000 euros. And that's a bit of a difference right there, right? So I'm really not sure. Yeah, that's like carpets for your horse's money. Yeah, it's a lot of money. Nice racehorse. Yeah. So then I checked, okay, could we compare it? How much was one kilogram of butter? So a little bit over two pounds of butter. And that would have been a bit under two mark in 1900. Today, one kilogram of butter would be around eight euros. So that's four times that. That would make 20,000 mark only 80,000 euros. So you see, this is all very confusing, but let's all agree on one thing. It was a nice sum of money. That's the most me bit of research I think you've ever done. That bi- <laughs> that, that's the most me thing I've ever heard come out of your mouth, where it's like, listen, <laughs> I looked it up, I found what it is, but also I'm not really sure. So I just have to cover all my bases in case I'm interrogated by the authorities on this on the way home. Here we go. Yeah. Welcome to my world. Yeah, that's a lot of money. Yeah, especially for someone who couldn't afford a liter of milk most of the days. Yeah. The annual fee for that insurance would cost the young couple 770 marks, so more than a yearly average income. Wow. Mm -hmm. If you paid it for a whole year, that is. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> well, you had to pay in advance. He had to pay the 770 mark oh, to get okay. the insurance. Okay. So he had to pay that to then be able to get 20,000 mark. Gotcha, gotcha. It comes as no surprise that Josefa was a little bit worried when she heard about that fee. How should they afford to pay that much money for life insurance? But Carl calmed his wifey down, telling her not to strain her little pretty head with thinking about finances too much. After all, He was the man and he knew what was best for them. This, after all, was an investment in their financial security. If something were to happen to him, she wouldn't have to worry about making ends meet. And so Josefa trusted her husband and designed the papers for the insurance company. Dun dun dun. Wouldn't you know it, only two months later, Josefa fell ill. Mm. She felt weak, nauseous had stomach cramps, and the doctor was called and he diagnosed food poisoning and ordered bed rest and some medicine. And isn't it such a great coincidence that the patient's own husband is a trained pharmacist who has his own little lab at home and he can make the prescribed medicine? I think that's so awesome. So good. So the the doctor told Karl Hopf, please uh, make this medicine I prescribed and Karl Hopf was such a caring husband, he was not only producing and administering his wife's medicine, but he was also constantly checking on her, taking her temperature, bringing her meals, bringing her tea. So weird that Josefa just wouldn't get better. On the contrary, she got worse and worse. She couldn't keep her food down, would vomit constantly and, of course, grew extremely weak. She died in the early morning hours on 28th of November. 1902. And because her illness was such a mystery to the family's physician, an autopsy was ordered. The only thing that was found was some irregularities in Josefa's bowels. It looked like a burst ulcer or something. Oh. And so the physician thought that was what must have killed the young woman, right? And I think it's important to let you know that the autopsy was held in the home of Karl Hopf at night in a badly lit room and Karl Hopf, of course, being present the whole time telling the coroner to hurry, hurry, hurry. The horse-drawn carriage was already waiting outside. Hurry up, hurry up. Uh, They want to take the body away. I could understand that kind of behavior if someone had brought a stranger into your house for an autopsy, which is something we know happened 
somewhat frequently back in the day, more frequently yeah. than anyone would like to think of, but surely behaving and still, this way. And even then, you don't stand next to the corner and This is what I'm saying. Food. And nobody yeah. thought it was a little bit sus. Like, nobody... No, and... um. Karl Hopf was such a grieving husband, but hey, thankfully he was consoled by almost 20,000 marks that he received from his late wife's life insurance. And there was just nothing. No one even wanted to see what kind of substances he had in his lab. Nothing. Nothing. Because, I mean, he was super open about uh, all the, the poison he had. Yeah, of at course, home and of the course. Bacilli and everything that he collected. Yeah. Karl met his second wife. In summer of 1903, somebody needed to wash those socks. I mean... There's a reason why I keep coming back to the socks. You're going to hear in the end. Auguste Christine Schneider was born on 26th of August 1883 as the daughter of Johann and Maria Schneider. So she was 20 years old at the time and therefore half the age of 40-year-old Karl Hopf, which is not unusual back then. Widowers and widows were more likely to get uh, remarried very quickly and and also pick younger spouses, especially the men. Uh, Christina's father couldn't stand his daughter's suitor from the very beginning, but her mother was smitten by Carl's charm at first. But during the time of the engagement, this pretty much changed when Carl would show his true character more and more often. He seemed to have very thinly veiled anger issues and Christina's parents begged their child to break off the engagement. There were so many red flags, apparently, but they didn't stand a chance. Christina had been brainwashed by her fiancé already and he threatened that she would suffer consequences if she would ever leave him and the consequences she would suffer would make him famous in, in whole Germany or something like that, he said. So we can all imagine what he meant, right? Yeah, that's that's... Yeah, And he also told her parents that they would move to London if they wouldn't back off. And that scared the parents because, I mean, if you're already thinking uh, your child is going to marry this, this man no matter what, then at least you want to have her close by and not in another country. Definitely. The couple got married on 28th of March 1904. Uh, much to the relief of Christina's parents, the newlywed couple did not move to London. But that didn't mean that they would see their daughter often. Carl kept his young wife away from her parents and from all of her friends. Carl's dog breeding earned him less and less, especially after a fellow dog breeder had reported him for treating dogs without being a vet. Uh, nothing much came of this, but people just didn't trust Carl Hopf anymore. So once more money was tight and Carl Hopf was getting more and more angry and frustrated, spending more and more time away from home. And let me guess, did he already have a plan on how he could get some money? Yes, he wanted to win the lottery. Oh, same. We have the same plan, Johanna. It's great. <laughs> he bought scratch-off tickets yeah, all the time. that's my plan. It's fine. No, wouldn't you know it? A year after their wedding, he took out a life insurance that would pay him 30,000 mark in case his wife would die. The annual fee for this insurance was almost double the fee for his last insurance uh, he had on Josefa, uh, 1,300 mark. And what a super weird coincidence, just a few months later, the previously absolutely healthy Christina fell sick. She started to complain about headaches, stomach cramps, nausea, and she grew weaker and weaker. And again, at first, the doctor thought she was just suffering from food poisoning, which was also, I mean, let's be fair, pretty, pretty common back then. Oh, without, yeah. yeah. You know, proper hygiene, proper cooling system. Yeah. But then she didn't recover and he actually thought she might be suffering from typhoid. So Christina was sent to a sanatorium and there her symptoms disappeared and she recovered quickly. It was also discovered that she was actually pregnant, so that was enough explanation for her symptoms, and she was sent home. No. Yes. And again, once home, she fell sick, constant headaches and throwing up. On 24th of February 1906, Christina gave birth to their daughter, Elsa. At first, Elsa was, was okay, was a healthy uh, newborn, but... Pretty quickly, she became a very sickly child, having trouble breathing. The doctor diagnosed bronchitis and Karl Hopf was asked to prepare and administer Elsa's medicine. 
Nothing helped. The child had more and more trouble breathing and she passed away on 9th of April 1906. Her short life had been nothing but sickness and pain. And also grief-stricken Christina didn't recover from her mysterious symptoms. Quite on the contrary, everything got worse. She lost a lot of weight from the constant nausea and diarrhea. Her joints started to swell and she developed pus-filled boils in her limbs. Oof. Christina's parents finally had seen enough and they took their daughter back home where she quickly recovered. Unfortunately, she returned to her husband once more and once more she fell sick. Same mysterious symptoms as before. And now, finally, people started to be suspicious. I mean, I think it's kind of obvious what's going on here, right? Right? I mean, maybe just to us. Yeah. I mean, people back then didn't listen to true crime podcasts That's and true. documentaries all the time. Yeah. So probably give them the benefit of the doubt. That's right. Anyway, people started to become a little bit suspicious and the housemate who really, really liked her mistress, Christina, uh, she noticed that Christina, well, she started to pay attention, right? And she noticed that Christina always got worse after her husband served her some tea. And sh so she informed Christina's parents of her, of her suspicion, telling them that she feared for her mistress's life. And once more, they came and they picked up their daughter and not only that, but Christina's father also pressed charges against Karl Hopf for murdering his first wife, Josefa, as well as poor baby Elsa, and for trying to murder Christina. Finally. Yes, an investigation was conducted. They even had famous forensic doctor Georg Popp trying to analyze Christina's urine and some stains caused by her vomit, but he couldn't find any evidence of poison. And we will be talking more about Georg Popp next week. The prosecution decided against charging Karl Hopf as all they had were some rumors and no hard evidence. Do we know if Karl was clever or was everyone else a bit inept? I just think trials worked different back then. Yeah. Like the circumstantial evidence was not so much of a thing, I have the feeling. Right. Yeah, they, needed, they felt they needed something more concrete. Got it. And what did Karl Hopf do? You'd think he'd lay low and try not to attract too much attention, right? I mean, I would. Yeah, but not him. He actually started to file complaints against everyone who had voiced their suspicions. So his former mate who had informed Christina's parents, uh, neighbors who had called him gift uh in public, so poisoner, and even to newspapers who had printed uh, something about the investigation. and. He won all of these lawsuits and he was awarded money each time. Ew. Mm-hmm. Okay, and what about Christina? Well, she recovered and obviously wanted a divorce. I mean, duh, finally. But that proved to be very difficult. She had hoped the fact that her own husband had tried to murder her would have been enough to grant her a divorce. Because uh, remember, different times, you needed a really good reason to get a divorce back then. But as there was no real proof that Karl Hopf had really poisoned her, she couldn't get a divorce that way. So her father hired a private eye trying to find some other dirt on Karl Hopf. And they did. Apparently he had sold pornographic photos, which was highly illegal at the time, and he had connections to the red light district in Frankfurt. To the surprise of no one, Karl Hopf was not well liked in sad scene. And it was actually easy to find a pimp to give testimony against Hopf. So Christina was granted a divorce and the judge even stated that all the pornographic material and the testimony of the pimp would be enough for 10 divorces. Christina remarried and had another child. Unfortunately, the child died at a very young age as well. And Christina herself passed away in 1911 at the age of 28, probably from tuberculosis. I really hoped for a happy ending for her after surviving so much, so many poisoning attempts. I have to stop complaining about my own health problems. At least no one is poisoning me, poisoning me, actively poisoning me. Do you think that the poisoning played a role though, like that it had weakened her too much or her whole, her organs or whatever? Do you think that could be? 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't know, do we know 100% that she died of tuberculosis? No, I think that was... Um, the possibility, the biggest yeah. possibility, apparently. I don't think, I don't see how that kind of poisoning repeatedly can do anything but damage to yeah. your vital organs. 
Yeah. True. That's tough. So after all this divorce and the murder and the attempted murder investigation, uh, all of that was quite a scandal, obviously. And Karl Hopf moved from the little town where he had his dog breeding business. He gave that up as well. His name was absolutely burned in the dog breeding community. Uh, don't worry, he found a new community. He joined the roller skating community. Wait, I'm sorry. It's not a joke. Sorry, what? Roller skating? He joined the roller skating community. Okay. He was like, yeah, heavily into roller skating. At <laughs> okay. Fencing, roller skating. This is a man of mystery. Dog breeding. So yeah, for a couple of years, he moved around in Frankfurt, not being able to keep an apartment for a prolonged time as he was constantly lacking money to pay his rent. He tried to start different kinds of businesses, uh, a matchmaking business, but failed. He tried to start a credit brokerage business, but failed. Big surprise there, right? <laughs> and <laughs> he started to teach fencing, which at least is something that he was really good at. Yeah. But he didn't find too many students. Yeah. His dream, though, he had a dream. Oh, he had a dream. I didn't know he had a dream. It wasn't fencing or roller skating? What was the dream? Well, he wanted to become a vaudeville act, performing <laughs> tricks with his saber. Uh, but for that, he needed to find a female assistant. So his trick would have been, or his trick was for the assistant to lie down and to place an apple on her throat. And then for Carl to slice the apple in half without touching the assistant's throat. <laughs> I wonder why he had a hard time finding a woman participating in this performance. He did, however, manage to find an assistant here and there and managed to do some performances under the stage name Athos. And I guess that came from, um, you know, one of Alexandre Dumas' Three Musketeers. Oh, right. Athos, Portus, and Aramis. Aramis. Yeah. Uh, we even have a poster uh, from one of his performances. So he was apparently really good and people uh, liked him. He was kind of a sensation. Around that time, Karl Hopf had also started to take care of his mother, who was now in her mid-70s. She was suffering from arthritis, but was otherwise really healthy, good condition. But all of a sudden, Karl visited her constantly, and he hadn't done often ever since his father had passed away. But now he really had a lot of interest in, her, in his mother, oh. taking good care of her. Good son. And he brought his mother her favorite wine and her favorite fruits. She didn't like to take medicine. She didn't believe in medicine. Unfortunately, and very weirdly, and as a big surprise for all of us here, she fell really sick all of a sudden. No. Suffering from headaches and nausea and joint pain. And she passed away on 6th of November 1911 at the age of 75. Her body was quickly cremated as her son and heir, Karl Hopf, claimed that this had been his mother's wishes. The same month his mother passed away, Karl Hopf was on the prowl for another wife to wash his socks. He had posted an ad in the classifieds claiming he was a well-off widower looking for a soulmate and that he had no financial interest. That, that's calming. That's reassuring. Right? Yeah. What's not to be happy about in that description? One of the letters he received was, was from a 29-year-old woman named Valisiewicz from Dresden. The two met up and after a short courtship, the couple got engaged and Carl suggested they get married in London. As reasons for this plan, he claimed that because Valle was Catholic, her father was Austrian, and he was a Protestant, it would be more difficult for them to get the marriage license and that it would be so much easier for them to travel to London and get married there. So they set the wedding date for 9th of April 1912, and I just now realized that 9th of April was the day his daughter Elsa had passed away. Wow, he, he really didn't give a single fuck, right? I mean, who gets married on the day your baby daughter dies, tragically? I mean, he killed her, right? The baby? Obviously. Yeah, yeah, he did. He doesn't... he doesn't care. But he's acting as if he didn't kill her. Right. And then, Right. Even, oh, I see what you mean. Like, even to, like, he couldn't, I guess he just couldn't even pretend he cared. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the wedding date was set for 9th of April in London. And a month before their wedding, he, ca he gave his new bride a premature wedding gift. He handed her an envelope with, now are you all going to say life insurance to sign? No, 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 no. 
he gave her an envelope with his will, where he made her his sole heiress to his vast fortune. Vale was so extremely touched that her fiancé was so eager to provide her with financial security in case anything should happen to him. And after their wedding, Carl handed her an insurance policy and he asked her to sign it in case of Vali's death, Carl would receive 80,000 mark. He also tried to get her to sign a will stating that she wanted to be cremated, but the Catholic Vali stayed firm and refused to do so. She didn't want to get cremated in case of death because that's not what Catholics do. I mean, it's... Back then. Or a soft, soft rule yeah. nowadays, but back then, yeah. It was a big deal back then. Okay, so the couple got married and Vali moved to Frankfurt, where she lived with her new, absolutely charming husband in a very nice apartment at Bülowstrasse 13. I think today the street has been renamed to Heidelberger Straße. From time to time, she would leave Frankfurt for a couple of days visiting her sister in Glashütten. I don't know if the name sounds familiar to you, but Glashütten is a small town situated in the Taunus mountain range in Germany, 30 kilometers or 18 miles northwest of Frankfurt. It's a very pretty area known for its picturesque surroundings, nestled amidst the forest and hills of the Taunus and perfect for hiking and cycling. So if you ever have the chance, do go. It's very pretty. The reason why I'm telling you this and the reason why you might know the name Glashütte, you're like, oh, that sounds familiar, is probably because of the famous German Glashütte watches. But fun fact, they are actually not produced in Glashütten in Taunus. They are produced in Glashütte in Sachsen, different town. Now you know, for pub quiz. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, genau. <laughs> Now, whenever Valli would leave her husband, he would use the time alone doing the dishes and laundry and thinking of all the nice things he could do for his <laughs> lovely wife. <laughs> You're laughing because you know it's not true, no. right? No, of course, he did no such thing. He was actually the worst. I mean, he's a murderer, yes, but uh, the worst. He's, he's horrible. I told you before how he was selling pornographic photos back when he was married to Christina. Well, it's not as if he had given up that side hustle. And now he not only sold these photos, but he also produced them. Oh. So every time his wife was gone for a day or two, he would hire some sex workers to come over to his place. And there he would take photos of him having intercourse with them. And then he would sell these photos to his wealthy clients. Oh. Now, one time after returning from her sister, Vali found a couple of very weird things. First of all, she found uh, used wine glasses. I mean, that man couldn't even be bothered to wash the glasses he used while cheating on his wife. Wow, like, the audacity. Uh, Vali was no fool and she decided to search the whole apartment. Under the sofa, she found a red silk ribbon that definitely didn't belong to her. She also found a, a rod or maybe a riding crop. I'm not 100% sure, but it was something used to whip and she had never seen it in their home before. Oh, no. So I assume it was a riding crop. Uh -huh. and neither she nor her husband were actually <laughs> into riding horses. Into riding horses. Oh, no. Yeah, now she really wanted to get everything out in the open. She's like, I'm going to nail this freaky son of a bitch to the wall. <laughs> Good for her. Yeah, we support her. And she decided to crack open her husband's desk drawers that were always locked. And there she found so much damning Evidence. Okay, first of all, she found papers that showed that he had been married before twice. She had only known about one wife who had passed away, but he had never mentioned his second wife, Christina, and that they had gotten a divorce. That's a big thing to hide from a Catholic. Yeah. Like, exactly. that's, a, that's kind of a deal breaker in terms of marriage yeah, at that yeah. time. That's a big deal. She also found papers showing that he was in debt. Serious debt. Mm. She found the life insurance she had signed and saw that the annual fee was more than 4,000 mark, which she also lied about. Oh. That's a fuck ton of money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's getting so much better. <laughs> she also found love letters from other women. I mean, okay, he had a life before her, but there's just one problem. These were not just love letters from before they had met and married. Uh, no, these letters proved that he had kept writing to other women even after they got married. 
Oh. And you know how nowadays people think, oh, social media and, and I don't know, everything on the internet is destroying marriages. No, these fuckers were out there writing letters 130 years ago. Of course they were. Cheaters are going to cheat. There's no... It's Social media it isn't ruining marriages. Yep. <laughs> people are ruining their exactly. marriages. Yeah. And then she found the worst. She found hidden, very well hidden, but not well enough, a flat box and it was full of pornographic photos and on these photos were always different women but it was always the same man having sex with those women and the man was wearing a very weird mask and a hat oh no kind oh, of a hat. that makes it so much worse <laughs> yeah. oh how does it make it so much i don't worse? know but i feel in my bones that it's gonna be worse because of a hat and a mask I'm telling you another thing that makes it so much worse. Vali knew exactly who that man was. You know why? Oh, why? Because he had kept his socks on. No. Oh, no. She knew these socks because she had washed them many times before. And she also knew the bracelet he was wearing. And of course, I mean, I'm sorry, she knew the naked body of her husband. Uh, this is so bad. We can all imagine how shocked Vali must have been. I would be shocked. I would be too. Everybody should be shocked about something like that. Yeah, don't surprise your wife with that kind of background. Be upfront with it. And then over breakfast the very next morning, while sipping her tea, Vali told her husband, Karl oh. Hopf Jr., <gasps> every single thing she had found. Yes, Wally. And I think this is the perfect moment to stop for this week. No. Next week, I will tell you how he reacted, <laughs> if Vali was going to be his next victim, and if there was ever proper punishment for his crimes. Ugh. Wow. I hope Wally's not his next victim. This is a wild ride. I am here for it. I did not... I don't know. I thought that he was going to be the good bad guy initially, I, and then I realized pretty quickly... He likes dogs! He liked dogs. It's fine. He's in defensing. What's not to like? Do you have something good? You know what's been on the news lately and it keeps making me really happy? There's, I'm going to get the details wrong. Um, there's a man who just underwent surgery at Mass General Hospital. And, hang on, I'm looking it up right now so I don't get it wrong. He was in a situation where he was in like a, I think he was in a situation where it was, it was try this surgery or he wasn't going to survive. So he is the first living person in the world to receive a kidney transplant from a pig. And this is just, this is an article by... Priyanka Dayal McCluskey for WBUR, which is our local um, NPR, like National Public Radio Station news. So yeah, Richard Slayman, congratulations to the Slayman family. This is amazing. The first living person in the world to receive a kidney transplant from a pig. He has been discharged from Mass General and is recovering now at home. It says he'd lived with kidney disease for years on March 16th. He received a genetically modified kidney from a pig, the first in the world. I'll post a link to the article. It's a really, it's a really interesting article, but essentially we know that there are not enough organs for the people in the world who need them. I've spoken before about donating my late husband's organs. We were able to donate some of my uh, late stepfather's organs who passed recently. It's such an incredible gift. So please make sure you're on the organ donation uh, list and make sure that the people that you love in your family know your desires because that's, that's a super, super important thing. And I was just so excited to hear this because this is just something that's going to save so many lives. I think we talked about it before, right? That in Austria, we have the, the opt out. I think that's how it should be everywhere. I'm sure we have talked about this, but it's been a few years, I think. So I don't know if all our listeners know in Austria, if um, you're automatically an organ donor. And if you don't want to be an organ donor, you have to actually opt out and carry like um, a card with you. I think that's how it should be everywhere. Now it's your turn. 
I already told you the weather is so nice and everything, but now I can finally really enjoy walking the dogs in the forest again. And it's, I don't know what it is about the woods, about the trees, the air, the, the birds. It gives me so much energy. You know what I mean? It's just so, so grounding in a way. I do like the woods. I am the the thing that sincerely keeps me from more outdoor enjoyment are the bugs. If you enjoyed this episode, please, 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 please do us the very great honor of leaving us a rating and a review. We are so appreciative every single time you leave a rating and a review or a comment on YouTube or on Spotify. We just love it. We love, love, love to hear from you. It's like texting us. It's the best. If you want more information on us, you can find us at freshhellpodcast.com. That's where you'll find where to listen to us, our email address, which is freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. You'll also find information on our Patreon program and how to become a part of that. Johanna, when is our next? We have an upcoming chat night, don't we? Yes, tonight. When you listen to this episode on Friday, the 5th of April, then it's tonight. That's right. What are we talking about? Are we talking about last week's episode? I think we should do that. Yeah. I think we should talk about last week's episode because I really want to hear everyone's, everyone's opinion. I do on too. That because that's really, yeah. Very much so. Tell your dog we say hi, all of them. Big special shout out this week to my friend Mary, who's been a longtime listener of the show. Her dog Kira had an incredibly long life, 15 years old, and she was the most amazing black lab. And so uh, everybody, please send send a shout out to vibes toward Mary this week as she's processing that. And uh, Kira will be looking forward to meeting all of our dogs on the other side because she was just a perfect lab and a perfect little angel. So that's why it's always important to hug them and cuddle so them as long as they're here. All the time. So be kind to them. Yeah. Be kind to your fellow human being once in a while, unless it's some cheating, poisonous, murderous asshole. Yeah, fuck that guy. <laughs> and hardest part of it all, be kind to yourself. It's the hardest part. That's it. Yeah. Just those 72 things, okay? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And until next week, if you're going through hell... Keep going. Tschüss. Bye.